Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for attending the Equipment and Fleer Systems webinar today. I'm going to give it another minute or so before I pass it over to Russell Hall from Fleer Systems, and we'll get started. Thank you for attending. All right, everyone, thank you for uh, holding there. Again, thank you for joining us today here at the equipment and welcoming Clear Systems and Russell Hall from Clear Systems today to present about leak detection and predictive preventative maintenance solutions with Clear Systems products. Russell, are you, are you there with us? Hey, Ryan, yes. How are you doing? Great. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. All right. You want to jump right into it? Go right ahead, sir. <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, as Ryan said, my name is Russell. I work with FLIR Systems. I've been with FLIR uh, a little over two years. Uh, one of their one of our channel partner managers. So I uh, work with T Equipment. Uh, 
thank them for putting this together so we can talk about a couple of our different solutions today. Um, and then also, if you ever need more information, uh, reach right back out to T Equipment and uh, Ryan and the team over there will be able to get you all the information that you need. Um, so with that, we'll uh, go ahead and get started. So a little of the agenda, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the leak detection overview. So where you know leak detection is used, where it's um, important, uh, the different applications. And then we're gonna talk about a couple of our newer solutions. One, our gas detection camera, our GF77. Uh, this is both a gas detection camera and a thermal imaging camera at the same time. So a lot of versatility built into this camera. And then also our SI-124, this is our acoustic imaging camera, uh, can detect both air leaks and partial discharge in one. So again, another versatile uh, solution here from FLIR. So a little about the target users and applications and you know where some of these products might come in, in handy. Uh, there's over 3,300 utilities that provide power transmission and distribution throughout the US uh, and even more here in North America when we talk about Canada and Mexico. Um, you know, different co-ops, municipalities, all of these, you know, using electric generation, nuclear, natural gas, coal and renewable energy, um, all of these different plants and different facilities are running gas, are running electricity. And if any of that gas or electricity is going to waste, you know, there, there's definitely a need there um, to, to lock those in, uh, to save those costs and for the safety factor, right? If you have a plant that is leaking gas, right? Not good. Uh, if you have a plant that is, you know, has partial discharge, you know, that could lead to arc flash and, you know, catastrophic failure, um, you know, equipment damage also shut down all the services uh, in that area. So again, um, you know, big reasons to do your routine maintenance, predictive preventative maintenance with these solutions to make sure that your facility is running top notch for the best efficiency and best safety. So if you're on this call, right, here's, here's some questions that, you know, if you answered yes to any of these, you, you found yourself in the right spot and I thank you for joining. Um, but do you have gas or air leaks that are hard to find? Um, you know, maybe you're on this call, do you have gas or air leaks that you think you have, but aren't sure, you know, because we can't see it, right? The human eye cannot see gas leaks or air leaks. So you think there's something there, it's been bugging you for a while, but you don't really know how to detect it. You know, maybe that's you. <clears throat> do these potential leaks create a safety or environmental hazard at your plant? Right? If you are leaking natural gas or you do have power lines or substations that are have partial discharge, right? That's a potential safety and environmental hazard. Do these leaks cost you money if left unattended? Uh, I can answer this one for you. Yes, they do. Um, even if it's a simple air leak, compressed air leak, not too much damage is gonna come from that, but you're paying for that air. Uh, we'll talk about some of that here later uh, as well. Do you want to find partial discharge failures? Again, our <clears throat> SI-124 camera can find both partial discharge and air leaks. So very versatile camera. You can do both things with one camera. Do you want to improve the reliability of your operation by, um, by creating your efficiency, right? You're going to have more reliable uh, machines and motors and you know uh, systems that's all going to improve the reliability of your operation do you wish every employee had access to a thermal camera for quick checks and safe and safe working environments you know yeah we, we probably do we'll talk briefly on some thermal imaging um, but again we're going to talk more about um, the si-124 and the gf-77 and then lastly do you think thermal imaging cameras are expensive you know, or acoustic imaging cameras or gas finding cameras. You know, do we think these are all expensive? Um, on the surface, yeah, they got a, a decent sticker price. You know, some of these could have a decent sticker price. But when you take into account, you know, if you had that camera and you solved that problem before it became an issue, 
but what's the ROI on that camera? You know, is it better to buy a camera up front and do your predictive preventative maintenance and stop that uh, substation from blowing up or that gas leak, you know, from starting a fire, right? All of that stuff, um, you know, it's just about service. So we'll talk about gas leaks first. So how do you find a gas leak? Uh, we cannot see it, right? A lot of times we, we can't smell it. Sometimes we can. But since the early 80s, right, the gold standard for leak detection has been the Method 21 or the, the TVA, the Toxic Vapor Analyzer. Now, this is a, a valid solution, but it's a slow and labor-intensive solution. Uh, doing a survey like this could take you several days. In addition, the TVA, it's got to be in contact with the leaking component in order to detect the gas. So if the operator misses the leak point, it may go unnoticed. And there's going to be hundreds, if not thousands, of different leak points in a facility. It, that's why the labor intensive is, is so uh, dramatic. You know, and if you miss one of those, you, you check all of them, but you miss the one that is actually leaking, but you're not going to find it. Uh, this also puts the, using the TVA, also puts the operator at risk um, because he's got to be so close to the equipment so close to all of these gas lines. Another method, you know, is the, the snoot method, the, the soap and water test. Again, labor intensive, but the idea here is you put a little soap, you put a little water on, on you know, where your valves are, and if you get some bubbles coming up, you know that there's some air escaping, you know that you got a leak there, then you can go and, and close that loop. Um, again, very labor intensive, walking around with, with the soap and, you know, a bucket of water, um, you know, to all those different potential leak points. Uh, a different one is your laser assisted, your RMLB. Now this, you can do it at, at a greater standoff distance uh, using the layers. Um, so it's a little safer. You're removing yourself from, you know, some of that danger. You're at a, a you know, again, a greater distance. Um, but it's not going to be able to detect all of the gases or if there's a bunch of wind or air moving around. Um, it's hard to sometimes locate exactly where that's coming from. So it's getting a little bit better, um, you know, but through uh, the different technologies, you know, and what FLIR has brought to the table, we think we have a, you know, better mousetrap. So again, some of these common challenges when you're looking for gas leaks are it's time consuming, right? We, we've, sunk, we've seen that. Uh, many of you have probably actually done some of these tests. It's hard to pinpoint um, where the leak is coming from. Again, because you have all of these different valves or hoses or mains that are going throughout your plant, you got to inspect all of them. Uh, it's also hard to do this around energized equipment. Um, in this picture to the right here, you see, you know, danger, stay hard, or, you know, hard hit areas, no smoking, you know, all of that. Um, so doing this presents um, a lot of safety hazards uh, when you're trying to perform these tests. It's easy to miss the leaks. The leaks would happen right under your nose and you not know it. Again, just because <clears throat> how many different spots you have to check, you, know, you might just pass right over one. Uh, and then gas is expensive, right? We, we pay for the gas. <clears throat> Why waste it? Um, so th this isn't necessarily a challenge, but more why we want to do it. So you, you're paying for this gas. We want to make sure that we're not wasting it. And then <clears throat> the environmental damage, uh, especially when we're talking about our circuit breakers uh, and sulfur hexafluoride and methane, SF6 and methane, you know, presents a environmental damage as well. <clears throat> SF6 is actually one of the most potent gases uh, to our greenhouse. Luckily, it comes in small batches, but if you do have uh, circuit breakers or bushings that are leaking this out, uh, it's really not good for the environment. And then lastly, <clears throat> safety, right? So um, without doing these inspections, without finding these, uh, these gas leaks, you can have explosions and or loss of life, loss of equipment. Uh, that can be very expensive, very hard to place, in some cases irreplaceable, uh, should we lose somebody's life. <clears throat> All right, so 
want to put something in perspective here. So do your employees wear PPE or FR clothing? Um, probably a lot of you are, are saying, yes, you know, this is a no brainer. So really though, when we think about it, PPE is more like a seat belt. It's the last line of defense. So everybody, you know, you've been in a car, you drive your car. Most of us, hopefully all of us are, are putting our seat belt on, right? And why do we put our seat belt on? We all think we're confident drivers, we all think we're good drivers, we obey the laws of the road, but you never know what else is out there that might hit you, that might come after you, right? So you put your seatbelt on as a live last line of defense. The seatbelts though, they don't prevent a car crash. Just because you have a seatbelt on doesn't mean that you're not, you know, doesn't mean that you're not gonna get into a car crash. Uh, and the same thing, PBE, it doesn't prevent you know, arc flash, for instance, All right? You put the PPE in case there is arc flash out there, but putting your PPE on <clears throat> does not prevent arc flash from happening. So another question, you know, related to this car, do you drive at night without headlights on? The answer is no, right? We, we turn our headlights on so we can see, so we can navigate, and so we know that we're not gonna run into anything. So why do we do electrical work in the dark? Right. If we had headlights to show us where all the hazards were, you know, if we had headlights to, to guide us to where we needed to be, um, you know, why do we do electrical work? Why do we just say, oh, I got my PPE on, so everything's going to be fine? You know, that, that's not the best answer. You don't put a 12 year old behind the wheel and say, oh, put a seatbelt on, you'll be fine. No, there's more that goes into that. And we're going to dive into some of those things that we can bring to light so that we can stop these potential hazards before they actually become a hazard. So there has to be a better way. Uh, what if you could scan large areas quickly and safely at a distance like an RMLD? Um, what if you could pinpoint exactly where the gas was coming from like a snoop or a TVA sniffer? What if you could document in a picture or a video the exact location of the leak to make repairing faster? Right. Here it is. Here's the leak. Send somebody in, fix it. I'm going to go back the next day, take another picture and see that it's fixed. Right. That's where we want to get to. That's where we need to be. That's where everybody can be the most safe uh, and operations can run the most efficient. So with that, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce our FLIR GF77, Gas Finder 77. So this is the first optical gas imaging camera that's versatile enough to also see thermal hotspots. And so we'll, we'll take a look at um, the different things that this camera can do. And again, this is gonna be applicable for many, many different, you know, utility plants, municipalities across the country. So the first thing, or one thing that this camera can do is it can do methane detection. Um, another is SF6 detection, again, for, you know, those, those, those breakers. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, is, you know, other gases that can detect is ammonia, uh, like combine, cycle, uh, combine cycles that, that use uh, ammonia. And then lastly, again, making it even more versatile is it can do your thermal imaging. It can find those hot spots. So you can use it for all of your predictive preventative maintenance as well. So this one camera will solve at least three problems that every plant will have. Every plant is, you know, could use a thermal imaging camera. And then each one of those plants, they, they're gonna be running methane and SF6 or methane and ammonia or methane or ammonia and SF6, right? Each one of these plants, each one of these facilities is gonna be using multiple of these different gases or, you know, heat detection hotspots uh, that this camera is valid for. So we'll, we'll dig in just briefly <clears throat> into how does the optical gas imaging work, right? A little bit behind the camera, um, how this camera actually detects uh, the gases that are leaking. So the camera sees more than gas only. It sees the things in the background, like pipes, people, ground, you know, the ground, plants, et cetera. 
But what happens is when there is a gas leak, that gas blocks the camera, blocks the lens from seeing those things. And so those objects do not reach the camera. So now when we have this gas leak coming through, now only some of these, you know, some of this, uh, you know, pipe or, or this person or, you know, whatever it is, only some of that image is coming through. Everything else is going to be fogged out. Kind of looks like smoke. Not necessarily smoke, but it'll, you know, it's when you look at a bonfire at night when you see the smoke coming out, that's kind of what it's going to appear like on your camera. So again, this gas is going to block our IR detector, our lens, from seeing all those objects, and thereby we can see that there is a leak coming from this valve. So when we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, <clears throat> you know, again, I, I promise I'm not going to go too deep into this. Um, you know, we have gamma rays, X rays, ultraviolet, visible, that's where our human eyes see, and then infrared, that's where our cameras are going to see, and then the microwave and radio beyond that. So what we do is we actually take our cameras and we tune them to these different wavelengths and so where that gas may become apparent we're going to tune these cameras to those specified microns so that we can see those different gases or see those different objects so if we look at this chart <clears throat> really quick so what we're doing with the camera is we're matching the spectral response of the camera to the peak spectral absorption of the gas. So on this chart, you see the transmission on the left side going up from zero all the way to 1.0. So that's saying, you know, the gas, it's transmittable um, all the way through, you know, 100%. Um, and then we have the different wavelengths on the x-axis there. So in these different microns, that gas does not transmit all the way. You can see that it comes down to you know, 0.3 or 0.2 or 0.1. That's where we're actually tuning the camera to see. So that's the, the smoke, if you will, that's blocking or obstructing our view from the valve that's behind it or the person that's behind it or the pipe that's behind it. So we actually match our camera and the microns to these different gases and the different gases they're going to have all. They're going to interact differently, differently, and transmit differently across different microns depending on what the gas is. Um, so a lot of this information is actually proprietary, but here's just a, a, again a little example of how we tune our camera and more importantly our, our lenses uh, to find these different gases. So some of the main gases that we'll see out of our GF77 is methane, uh, CO2, uh, CO, SF6, and R22. So now let's look at an example. Uh, this here is a, is a fuel skid that is leaking uh, methane gas. This is again shot with our GF77. Now I know we're over... Um, you know, video here um, through uh, go to webinar. So hopefully this video is coming through. Um, I got strong internet today, um, so hopefully you can actually see that this gas is is leaking, uh, coming right from this little valve here. Uh, you'll see that the camera. We got different modes that you can uh, switch this mode into, or switch this camera into uh, to give you different different images. Um, but again, so what we're looking at here is a a fuel gasket with a methane leak at a power plant. Now, maybe some of you guys are on a power plant today, or you know, you've worked in power plants, or you've done surveys in the past. You know, one of the questions is, don't we already solve for methane leaks with merc uh, mercaptan? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, you know, mercaptan it gives that gas that smell. Um, you know, that bad smell kind of sounds or smells like rotten eggs. Uh, but in most plants that have natural gas. You can really start to smell that, you know, right when you walk onto the grounds. So, you know, yes, we have that, but it's not going to pinpoint exactly where you're going to see it, or we actually become almost numb to that smell uh, if you're working in that environment day in, day out. Now, if you came back home after working, you know, at a power plant, 
and then you walked into your kitchen and it smelled like gas. Now that would be a new smell, right? Our kitchens hopefully are not smelling like methane gas. You know, your oven's not leaking. But and that would draw our senses and heighten our senses. But when you're in a power plant, you're not always going to get that same phenomenon. Um, people might smell like that right when they walk into the plant. So this camera, you know, is going to find a lot of those leaks even before you might even smell it or even because before you become aware of it. Here's another uh, methane leak. Uh, this is a, a flange. And again, you're going to see the camera go into uh, three different modes here. Um, we're going to have our thermal image, our visual image, and then also our enhanced high sensitivity mode. <clears throat> now, earlier in the in the presentation, I showed you know some of the different challenges or you know the different hazards, and showed that. Uh, you know, the no smoking, you know, no no lighting, all that. This is why, right? If we're not aware of our environment or gas leaks that might be happening, we strike a match, right? This is exactly why. Um, and again, that PPE, right, it might help you a little bit, but this is the headlights, right? This is, you know, the, the Volvo, the safest car, right? This is <clears throat> finding that leak and stopping it before it becomes a problem. Ryan, um, just so I know, are these videos coming through okay? Can you see the, you know, what looks like smoke, you know, the, the gas leak coming out? Or is it choppy, yep. is it blurry? Yeah. No, it's actually coming through pretty good. Okay, perfect. All right, so then another another video here, switching gears a little bit. Um, and you can see on the bottom right corner, here we got this green square and we're looking for SF6. In the past, you know, the, the other two videos here, uh, this one doesn't have it, but we got this red lens um, and the different microns, right? So this is, this is tuned to seven to eight and a half microns. Now SF6, again, like I talked about, is going to be, you know, different microns, it's going to be transmitting at different spots. So now we change the lens um, and you got this green square here and the microns for this is nine and a half to 12. So what we're looking for here is uh, SF6 or sulfur hexafluoride. Um, so in order to do this, again, like I said, all we have to do is change the lens. It's the same camera. You don't have to buy a $100,000 camera for finding methane and then a $100,000 camera for finding SF6. You don't have to do that. We have what we call our low range and our high range lenses. So when we're looking at this at this breaker, we can actually see some of the SF6 leaking out. This one is a little bit harder to see, so hopefully you can still see it, but you can kind of see it coming off the top right here. And then depending on the wind, it's kind of going up into the right and, and, or down into the right a little bit. You also might notice a couple things that look like shooting stars. I'm trying to craft it with my mouse right now. Um, you know, those are actually bugs. You know, those are just bugs flying around in, in, the, in the background in the sky there, uh, which is pretty cool. But again, just the detail and um, you know, the power of this camera, it's <laughs> its tracking those bugs. And again, it kind of looks like a shooting star coming across the screen. So again, one camera, um, you can find your methane, you can find your ammonia, you can also find your SF6, your, you know, your carbon monoxide, all of those different gas leaks. It can also do uh, heat spots. And you can use either lens for thermal imaging. You can use your, your low uh, your low res or your high res uh, lenses. So now this is just a, a, a picture of a breaker here. Um, nothing is necessarily wrong with this image, but you know there's not like a hot spot or you know that this is about to explode or anything like that. But just the the detail that you can see. So this is a you know a 320 by 240 camera that's very powerful. So you have that good standoff distance. Um, we have 25 degree lens and six degree lens. So 
even if you leave it a lot farther, you can get that six degree lens um, and just really paint a nice picture here. So again, you know, all the gases that you want to see, the common gases <clears throat> and the uh, thermal thermal imaging. So we'll, we'll go over just a couple of the specs really quick. Um, so the temperature ranges has three different temperature ranges that you can set this to, negative 20 to 80, 0 to 250 Celsius, and then 0 to 500 degrees Celsius. This camera also comes with uh, onboard routing uh, is available. Uh, and what our routing software is, if you're not familiar, our routing software is you can actually program into your camera all of the different things that you want to inspect on a, on a plant or in a facility or on a site. So what's nice about that is if there are 50 or 75 or 100 things that you know, every month or every two months or whatever your schedule is that you want to inspect, this software will actually tell you, okay, we're going to start here. We're going to do this breaker panel. Then we're going to move to the you know, east side of the building and we're going to shoot, um, you know, this flange, whatever it is. So it's nice for a couple of reasons. One, you can plan out your day uh, a lot, lot better, a lot more efficient. So you can actually kind of like map, like, okay, if I started in this corner of the building, then I'd walk around this wall, then I'd turn right here and go there. Then you can actually kind of, you know, maximize the steps that you're taking throughout the day. And then secondly, you make sure that nothing is missed because this is going to tell you where to go next. Hey, go here and take an image. Um, so you can do all of that. Uh, so it's really nice software that you can build into the camera. And it makes all the reporting on the back end a lot easier as well. Uh, the temperature actually accuracy of this camera is plus or minus three degrees Celsius, uh, which is which is really good. Uh, you know, and, and definitely when you're looking, when you're doing your thermal inspections, right? If you have something that's 150 degrees, but you know it shouldn't be more than you know 100 degrees, you know you got an issue, right? Using thermal imaging cameras is about heat anomalies. <clears throat> Then we have the different lenses. So like I said, the, the HR lenses are, are um, high range lenses. So these are for the spectral range of nine and a half to 12 microns. So the biggest gases here that you're gonna use this lens for is SF6. And then also the secondary gases is ammonia and uh, ethylene. Uh, we have the 25 degree and the six degree field of view lenses available. Then we have our low, uh, low range lenses. And again, you know, so you'll see the different spectral range there, seven to eight and a half. Primary gas here is going to be methane, um, but different gases as well that you can see is sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide, and then your R134 and your R152A. And then again, you know, the different lenses here, the 25 degree and the six degree. We'll look at, uh, you know, just pricing or kind of the different configurations really quick uh, as well. So the base model is gonna come with the camera and generally one of our 25 degree lenses. That's gonna be the most common. Uh, you can get either the HR or the LR lens. Uh, it's gonna be roughly $30,000. Then you can do that plus another lens, you know, another 25 degree lens and it's gonna be about another $5,000 for that lens. You can mix it up and get the six degree lens. Um, so you can buy it at any kit configuration. You can also purchase the purchase the lenses after the fact. So if you know, hey, I want to start with the GX77, you know, HR lens um, because you want to go see those gases. But then six months later, a year later, say, hey, you know, the, the LR lens would really come in handy as well. You can buy that after the fact. Uh, we'll help you calibrate it, um, get that lens calibrated to your camera, and then boom, you're off to the races. So this is this the prices here are really, you know, there's an extreme amount of value. We make other gas imaging cameras, and they usually start around you know six figures, like a hundred thousand dollars, and they're only detecting one type of gas. So what we've introduced here is really a game changer uh, with all the versatility and the value and the price 
of this camera. So <clears throat> definitely uh, encourage you to check these out if any of that uh, you know was applicable to you. Switching gears a little bit now, we're going to talk about uh, you know some different leaks um, that we can find in, in using our acoustic imaging camera, our SI-124. So this is a early detection of potential failure. So this little chart here, we call it the DIPF chart, not the best acronym, but the DIPF chart. So when we think about this, if you're thinking about a critical machine or critical infrastructure, that you're you know, installing or getting up and running, right? When you first buy that machine, maybe it's a press machine you know, in your metal, metal shop, uh, you know, in your manufacturing plant. When you first buy that machine, it's designed and that thing should be 100% ready to go. Then you install it and we still expect that thing to perform you know, 100% out of the gates. Kind of like buying a car, right? You buy a car, you expect that you hit the gas, the car goes forward, you hit the brakes, the car stops, you, your windows still work, your radio still works, all of that stuff. But then you own that car, you own that machine for a while, and then there's going to start to be some wear and tear. So that's going to be, you know, this P on the chart, the point at which failure can begin to be detected. One of the first indications of, you know, degre degradation of your equipment is ultrasound. Uh, you might have an ultrasonic spike where you know something's not aligned right or something's coming loose and it's going to create you know these tiny wavelengths, these tiny sounds um, that can be detected by ultrasound. As we go further right down then you have vibration after that. So maybe you own that car for you know five years or six years you got a hundred thousand miles on it now you're on the highway going 70 miles an hour and you're like hey my car is starting to rattle right um you know it's starting to shake or i've never felt this uh, you know i've never heard this before right the older that car gets right the more problems it's going to have the more service it's going to need um you know oil analysis and then you know thermography is another thing right thermography which clear is you know the worldwide leaders in you know, is actually kind of further down, uh, down this chart on when failures can start to be caught um, and, and corrected. So, um, you know, the other, the other nice thing about FLIR and all of our solutions is we are becoming, you know, more of that full uh, solutions provider where we have ultrasound solutions, we have vibration solutions, we have thermography solutions. So what is ultrasound, right? Because that's what we're, what we're going to talk about today. So some of the key characteristics of ultrasound is, you know, it's technology that involves using high frequency sound waves, which are beyond the, the range of human hearing. Um, that can be produced by our different equipment. The sound waves themselves are highly directional in nature and tend to be produced by discrete localized sources. So they're coming from like one spot. Right? It's going to be a small spot. Um, it's impossible for a human to detect it without, you know, a, a camera like this. The ultrasonic waves, they, they tend to be indicative of equipment degrade, degradation. So when we find them, we can use them as early warning signals of future equipment failure. Um, ultrasonic inspection tools are a valuable part of comprehensive asset management. Uh, which is important for helping companies save money, increase product quality, worker safety, while reducing unplanned equipment outages. So again, when we can find these problems, you know, these minor problems before they become big problems, that's where you're going to get your ROI. That's where you're going to get the return on your investment from saving this machine. <clears throat> Excuse me, from saving this machine from shutting down, right? Because when this machine shuts down or breaks down, now you can't make your widgets. <clears throat> Excuse me, grab a drink. When that shuts down, your production line stops, right? And that costs you money, plus the repair that you have to do. When all along, maybe it was tightening a, you know, tightening a bearing or, you know, adding some oil, you know, to the machine to make sure that it was still, you know, running properly. So ultrasound again, you know, we'll look at 
you know, the, the sound wave, you know, the different types of sound here. Um, but basically what it is is a, a pressurized leak that will cause turbulence, which can be located uh, using ultrasound. So when these air leaks, so when air leaks into air, finding it using any other method than ultrasound can be difficult. Um, with this advanced ultrasonic system, we can make it very easy for you. One of the common questions is, you know, what about the background noise? You know, I'm in a manufacturing plant and there's a lot of other background noise. You know, how does the camera work in that type of environment? So we actually filter that background sound out by tuning the camera to the right side. Uh, if we look at this little chart here, to the right side, you know, we've got this green even towards the end of the green of the acoustic wavelength, essentially muting everything else. And this is similar to a dog whistle, right? You might have a dog whistle where we blow this thing and dogs, they can hear at higher frequencies. We blow this whistle. We humans don't hear anything, but our dogs perk up, right? And they run right back to us. So the cameras is kind of the same. It can, <clears throat> it can filter out all of that other noise. You know, that's further left here, the infrasound, the acoustic, the ultrasound. Um, it can filter all of that and really just pinpoint um, and pick up the stuff right uh, to the right side of this chart. So our camera uses multiple microphones that allow the, that allow the camera to triangulate the source, right? So it's like watching, you know, some crime scene, right? Where they're doing, they're pinging the GPS and they triangulate it, right? To, to find the bad guy where he was last. Um, we kind of do the same thing with our camera. We use all these different microphones and all of those microphones are picking up different sounds, but when there's one sound coming, then they all kind of triangulate on it and it pinpoints where that actually is. So we do this by combining an array of microphones, um, like I said, a camera, and you can pinpoint the sound location on a picture. So that's what you see right here, this picture to the right kind of blown up, and you have this little rainbow. Right, red on the inside, then green, and then a blue ring around that. So that's how we triangulate that sound. All those microphones are kind of pointing, saying, hey, this is where the source of that is. Um, by using a, a camera like this, the imaging technologies, you know, it's going to give you a 90% reduction in inspection time. Again, you just walk around with this. It's one-handed use. It's very lightweight. You just walk around your facility and, you know, at a slow walk and you just point this at, at all of your different failure points, you know, or all of your different pipes and your different valves. And if anything is there, this camera is going to pick it up and give you this nice image of where exactly it is. So why so many markers? So our camera is called the SI-124 because we have 124 microphones on it. So uh, a reason why more microphones is better is for locating the exact source of the issue. Just like with a common digital camera or thermal camera, you know, or, or your TV, right? More microphones or more pixels, um, the more you have, the better detail you're going to have. Uh, of that image, right? March Madness is right around the camera, or right around the corner. And, you know, if you're trying to watch March Madness on a, you know, 200 DPI TV, you're going to be pretty disappointed. But if you get that 1080 DPI, right, that's going to be a nice picture. So the microphones are kind of the same. The more microphones we have, the more, uh, the better we're going to be able to pinpoint that location and pick up those sounds. So what are some of the different applications for this SI-124? Uh, one is electrical partial discharge, compressed air system leak detection, vacuum system leak detection, um, you know, and a plethora of others. So there's many applications for this, um, but the ones that tend to have the biggest return on investment um, for most of our users are the three at the top there, your electrical partial discharge, compressed air systems, and then vacuum system leak detection. So air leaks cost money, right? Once you have that air leak, we're paying for that air, right? We're bringing it into our facility, we're bringing it into our plant. 
Um, and any of that that gets wasted, that's just dollars coming out, right? That's just waste every day, every week, every month, every year. If that goes unattended, that's just wasted money. And our finance and our controllers, they don't like to hear that. Or you could be their hero by solving that, solving this issue and saving them money. So there's a couple studies here. Uh, the Department of Energy estimates that up to 30% of a manufacturing facility's electricity is consumed for compressed air. So 30%, almost a third of the electricity in a manufacturing site is for compressed air. That's a ton of usage. Then on average, one third of compressed air, all of that air that you're bringing in, one third of the air is wasted due to leaks, misuse, pressure drops, and overpressurization. So of that 30% that we're spending our uh, electric, electrical bill on, a third of that is actually just getting wasted. It's just you know going up in, into the air in our buildings. So based on a typical manufacturing facility running at you know like a 200 horsepower compressor, six to 800 hours a year, you know even if it costs you 11 cents a kilowatt, right? If any of that is leaking. You know, we could save you by finding that leak, by using this camera to find that leak and to fix that problem. You could save $38,000 just on that alone. You know, and you might have multiple compressors in your building. And all you got to do is tighten that valve or switch out that hose. Um, simple, cheap fixes, um, and you could really be saving, you know, big bucks. So the ROI is, you know, uh, extremely valuable here. So again, using this camera, all you have to do is trace your facility from your compressor uh, all throughout where your air could be going. And if you see something like this on this image, again, we get this nice rainbow looking image. If you see something like this, you found a, a leak or a problem. Simply take a picture, so you stop, take a picture, um, you can save it, you can boost it up to the cloud, and then you can share that image and you know, if you're not the person that's actually going to be doing the repair, maybe you walk through your facility, you find five problems, and then you report those five problems out via an image, um, and they can clearly see where this is taken with the visual context uh, behind it. Now they go and do their fix. You come back with the with the acoustic imaging camera, and you say, yeah, that air leak is fixed. I don't see that, that leak anymore. Here's another uh, instance, right? These leaks can happen anywhere. So here, you know, maybe it's just a, a, an old connection, you know, or this looks to be outside. So maybe it's just been through the ringer a little bit and we just don't have a good seal anymore. Um, you know, you have, a, you have another leak here. So again, closing up that leak, tightening up that valve, whatever it is, you're gonna be saving money because that's, that's money that you're paying for. That's just dollars. Um, coming out of there day in and day out. The SI-124, again, right, it can't, it's not only going to do uh, air leaks, but also partial discharge. So there's three types of, uh, three different types of partial discharge, uh, in all of which create significant problems. Um, so imagine you're in a substation and you're looking for partial discharge on the insulators, uh, that are made of porcelain. They get wet, you know, water inside or start to degrade. You know, what could possibly happen? You know, they could explode. And if these porcelain trades, you know, um, or shards go flying out, you know, it could be very dangerous for both the people in that environment and the equipment in that environment. So the different uh, types here, we have corona, that's ionization or, or fluid or air surrounding a conductor. Um, when we're walking under power lines, that's that little buzzing sound that we tend to hear. Then we have tracking. So a surface tracking over a contaminated insulation. <clears throat> and then arcing, you know, electrical breakdown of a gas producing a plasma discharge. This is probably one of the more serious ones. This is where, you know, we might have those, those uh, bigger catastrophes or, or bigger explosions. So with our camera, um, when we're looking for partial discharge, <clears throat> you do a couple of things. One, so you point the camera at, you know, the, the different equipment, you know, in your substations, 
um, you know, your power lines, your, your uh, transmission lines. You point it at it. Um, these things, have, this camera can work up to over 300 feet. So you find a, a, a problem, you find that image, one, you, you take a picture of it. Goes up to the cloud, right, as we all like to say. Then we have a software program that actually has artificial intelligence that will process these images for you and help you decipher what you're actually looking at. And then depending on what you're looking at, that AI is going to kick out, you know, one of three different things. One, it's discharged into the air. Two, it's discharged to a component. Or three, what we're, you know, really going to be most concerned about is it's discharged internally. And again, this one is this is going to be the one that's going to indicate, you know, a bigger problem. So the camera and the software will actually help you make that determination. <clears throat> and then if it is just, you know, discharged into the air, maybe that's not something that we're too concerned about. And, you know, you don't need to send somebody up there to go repair it. But when the camera, when the software does tell us that we have this discharge internally, now we're going to want to really, you know, take a deeper look at that. So here's another image of a faulty insulator. And then just a quick tip when you're, when you're using this camera, when you're doing these inspections, you're also going to want to visually inspect the equipment that you're looking at. So, you know, maybe there's, you know, bird poop or, you know, some rust or, you know, dirt debris. Um, some of those things, you know, might cause some acoustic uh, activity. But do that visual inspection. Um, if it does look clean, if the surface does look good and you are seeing something like this, then you are more likely than not going to have some sort of issue that should be uh, looked at and corrected. So again, one, take your image, save it to a cloud, save it to the cloud. Um, you know, the cloud, the, the software is going to tell you, hey, here's a discharge surf on the surface or inside the component. Now that's something that we want to take into consideration. Now it's nice too, you can actually schedule your time. Hey, when can I shut this down? When can we get somebody out here? You know, maybe it doesn't need to be looked at right this second, but on Saturday, you know, or, or Tuesday night or whatever it is, whenever that inspection happens, um, now you can more schedule that repair um, to make it an easier fix. Here's surface discharge <clears throat> on an insulator. Again, you know, after running this through the software, we get the, um, the notice that this is discharged on the surface or inside, you know, the component. Again, we're standing on the ground, you know, pointing up to this that's, you know, pretty high in the air. We get this nice image and we can clearly see, you know, that we're going to have this issue. Again, you can, uh, you know, schedule the repair, get somebody up on a, you know, on a cherry lift or whatever you got to do to get somebody up there to take a better look at it uh, and make sure that it's a safe condition. Here's a floating discharge. So not necessarily, you know, a, a, an issue here, um, you know, but sometimes between the, between our different components, we might have, you know, some of this uh, discharge between the two of them. Um, again, <clears throat> this isn't going to be a, a big cause for concern, but our software is going to tell you that and reinforce, hey, you know, this is okay, don't worry about it. Um, so really quick, and then we'll open it up for, for some Q&A, but we'll just run through some of the different features of the SI-124. Again, big takeaway here, it's one camera that can do multiple applications. It can do both your air leaks and your partial discharge. It's lightweight and portable. Uh, it's just over two pounds. Uh, it can be operated with one hand. So um, very easy to, to carry this thing around your facility um, and, and do these different scans. The operating range um, is from close to mid distance. So anywhere from one to you know 50 feet and then all the way up to over 300 feet. So again, for those, um, when you're standing that, <clears throat> on the ground and you got transmission lines, power lines, you know, 200, 250 feet in the air uh, in front of you, it can detect all of those, uh, you know, from the ground. 
Uh, there's both built-in plus external replaceable battery uh, that allows up to eight hours of operating time. So you can get a full day's work on one charge <clears throat> using this uh, using this camera. It also has Wi-Fi. So um, if you do have like your phone out there with you or tablet with you while you're taking these images, you can boot these right up to the cloud right away. And you know while you're still on site or in front of that you know component or that um, uh, you know, in front of that substation, you can do some of that analysis right there before you even bring this back to the computer. Obviously, using the computer, it's going to be a bigger screen and easier to use, but you can do all that stuff um, with the built-in Wi-Fi. It's got a you know big five-inch screen, so easy easy to see. Uh, the operating temperature is you know 14 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit. So basically, in, in any you know uh, condition, inside outside, for the most part, um, you can use this camera no problem. And then lastly, um, our MSRP on this camera is you know nineteen thousand nine ninety nine. So again, finding one of these air leaks or you know one of these partial discharge uh, issues, you know, can pay for the camera itself. You know, you get that ROI easy. Um, you know, in a couple of months of using the camera, a year of using the camera, <clears throat> it really starts to pay for itself. All right, Ryan, I will uh, kick it off to you. Um, you know, if there's any questions that came through the chat or, um, you know, any maybe general questions that, that you might have if I didn't cover something. Yes, I really appreciate the the presentation, Russ. I think it covered covered pretty much every uh, every type of customers we have here at, at T Equipment. Um, I don't have any any questions that anybody came in. If anybody wants to uh, email them in to us or uh, chime in now, you're you're more than welcome to. Um, again, I, I we really appreciate you uh, joining us today, Russ. Um, for those who jumped on maybe a little bit later, uh, T Equipment is, um, we've been in business for over 15 years now. Um, we're a very large distributor of clear products and we have uh, several on staff thermographers. So if you do have any questions after this and we didn't get, get to you or for some reason they're not, uh, not able to get them here. Actually, here, here is one. Is there a mi minimum pressure that it can detect? Can it detect as low as a quarter PSI? <clears throat> um, that's a good question. I don't, I don't have that in front of me right now. We, we do have a, um, a range. I, I could pull up a, a data sheet really quick. Or Ryan, um, you know, I can get that information over to you. And then, uh, you know, if you have this person's email, we can send over that spec sheet. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know it off the top of my head, so I don't want to speak, but, uh, you know, it, it is pretty low. It can, it can detect, you know, these gas leaks or, you know, the compressed air leaks um, at a pretty low rate. Yeah, and uh, that data sheet, if you, uh, if you go into our uh, keyequipment.net website and search the uh, any of these cameras, uh, it'll bring you to their their home page, like a landing page for that item. And if you, you scroll down a little ways on the right hand side, you'll see uh, manuals, and you, you'll be able to pull up that data sheet. But feel free to reach out to us as well. Let me see if I have any other questions here for you, Russ. Oh, that looks like it. Hey, well, we thank everybody for attending today, and thank you again, uh, Russ. You did a great job today. Um, anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out via email, join our website at tequipment.net, um, sign in, create an account. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, please reach out to T Equipment for any further, further questions or interest.